I will have a voice. I'm afraid to whistle. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. So the request was, when we get to the question portion, if you have a question, please stand up. It helps everybody here. Uh, thanks, Rodney. As Rodney said, my name is Scott Robinson. I am a city planner with the city and county of Denver and working on the East Central Area Plan. Uh, I've got a brief presentation to go over, and then we'll get to the question and comment section. Uh, just sort of a brief overview of, of the plan so far and where we are. Um, and then, as Rodney said, tonight we were asked to speak specifically about height and density, so that's really what we're going to talk about. But the plan covers a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm going to go over very briefly. So I don't want you to think that's all the plan is about. Uh, and please come to those upcoming meetings to learn more and contribute to those other sections of the plan. Um, so the East Central Area Plan uh, is a neighborhood plan we've been working on for the last two years or so, and it covers uh, six neighborhoods in Central Denver. Uh, so it's North Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill, Cheeseman Park, Congress Park, City Park West, and City Park. So we'll group those six neighborhoods together uh, to create a new neighborhood plan, and this plan will replace your previous neighborhood plan. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with the 1995 Congress Park Neighborhood Plan. Uh, this plan uh, will replace that. We've read that plan. We've taken what's uh, still relevant from that plan and we're carrying it forward. Uh, and this will be your new neighborhood plan. Um, I know there's been some uh, questions about what exactly is happening. I've seen some of the flyers and some of the, the posts that have gone out uh, saying that the neighborhood is being rezoned. Uh, that is not true. That is not what a plan does. Okay. Right, and I'm saying that information is incorrect. This is not a rezoning, this is adopting a plan, which is a policy document, and that's what the uh, city looks to for future rezones. So we'll set the guidance for when things do get rezoned, if they do get rezoned, uh, but this plan will not itself rezone any property. The plan is, a, as I said, a policy document. It sets the 20 year vision for what we want to see uh, for these six neighborhoods. Okay. Let's keep our questions till the end, please. Let him get through his presentation. So, so th as Thank I said, you. this document sets policy and that the rezoning is a separate process that happens, potentially happens afterwards. Right, and when somebody, when somebody requests a rezoning, uh, there are five criteria that have to be met. The first one of those is consistency with adopted plans. This will be the plan we look to to judge that consistency. Okay? So this will set the policy for potential future rezonings, but will not itself rezone any problem. Can we please hold questions until... Let's get through the presentation, guys. Okay. We're going we're to move on. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the Denverite plans and citywide plans that were adopted earlier this year, Blueprint Denver, the Comprehensive Plan. Those were, as I said, citywide plans set very high level goals. This plan uh, takes those goals and applies them specifically to these neighborhoods. So it provides more detail, uh, more guidance, and it can also update those plans uh, if changes are needed to those plans. Do we have any input? Yes. That's, that's why we're here tonight, to gather input. Um, as I mentioned, we've been working on this plan for about two years. Uh, we are getting close to the end, but we are by no means at the end. Uh, we are still working on creating the draft plan, so we're still taking public comment. Uh, the plan is to have a draft plan for everyone to review in early October. Uh, we'll host a uh, community open house to present that plan. We'll have the plan available for a couple months for everyone to read through. It'll be a big plan, so we want to give you plenty of time to read through it, understand it, and meet with your neighborhood groups uh, to form opinions on it. We'll take comments, uh, update the plan based on those comments, and then we'll go through an adoption process with planning board and city council. So there will be public hearings before planning board and city council, and it's, it's ultimately city council who decides uh, whether to adopt the plan and what ultimately goes into it. So we started out the process, uh, as I said, about two years ago, uh, trying to develop a vision. We have a, a steering committee made up of neighborhood representatives uh, that has been helping us with this process. Miles from Congress Park has been on the steering committee. He's been a great member the last two years. Uh, they helped us develop this vision. Uh, I'm not going to read it. I know maybe not all of you can see it in the back. 
Um, but the idea is to create uh, more walkable and bikeable neighborhoods, uh, preserve the character of the neighborhoods. Everybody loves their neighborhoods and the character of those neighborhoods. We want to maintain that while also allowing for uh, additional affordable housing. Uh, we know that we have an affordable housing problem in this city and we need more affordable housing to meet our citywide goals uh, to create an inclusive and affordable city. Um, we want to improve the safety of walking to open spaces and parks uh, and then improve uh, landscaping and uh, protect the great tree canopy that we have. We know, especially Congress Park, has great trees, uh, so we want to make sure that those are maintained and kept in, in healthy fashion. We uh, have been working with the neighborhoods, with the community the last few years. We've held a series of workshops. We've been to uh, RNO meetings. We met with this RNO, a much smaller group of this RNO, uh, about two years ago in this room. Um, We've had uh, online surveys where we've had pretty good uh, turnout. Um, and those are all the, the inputs that we've used so far, along with the guidance from our steering committee uh, to develop the recommendations that we have right now. Uh, in that initial process, we realized that uh, we weren't reaching a representative sample. We weren't reaching everyone in these neighborhoods. Uh, so we're taking a, uh, a targeted approach to try to reach some additional groups uh, when we did the first round of outreach, most of the people who responded were uh, wealthier, whiter, and more likely to be homeowners than the neighborhoods as a whole. So we took some uh, special efforts to reach uh, renters, non-white folks, and uh, younger folks uh, to uh, round out our, our public engagement. So I'm going to go over some uh, general highlights of draft recommendations. As I said, these are still draft. Uh, we we're working on putting them into, um, flushing them out, putting them into a draft plan, uh, but everything at this point is still draft. Nothing has been decided. Uh, the, uh, in terms of land use, the idea is to incentivize um, smart growth, inclusive growth around additional transit stations, so mostly along uh, the major corridors, Colfax, Broadway, Lincoln, and Colorado, where we expect to have uh, higher capacity transit in the future. Uh, for economy, we're looking at uh, partnering with the hospitals in the community. We have uh, National Jewish here in Congress Park, and then Presbyterian St. Luke's and St. Joseph's up in City Park West. Uh, those are important uh, partners for us in the community. So uh, working with them to achieve economic development goals, and also supporting the small businesses that everyone loves in the community. Uh, for mobility, we're looking at improving the streets and improving uh, the bicycle and pedestrian crossings and safety, a lot of the stuff that Ashley and Public Works folks were just talking about. Um, those are the general goals. Make it uh, safer and easier to walk around, to bike around. Uh, and then for what we call quality of life infrastructure, which is really the parks and parkways, uh, we have some great historic parkways like 7th Avenue here. Uh, so making sure that those are still the gems of the community and really serve the community, and then uh, creating some of what we call contemporary parkways on uh, existing streets uh, by bringing them up, adding more landscaping, more trees, and making them, again, safer and better for pedestrians and cyclists. So this is really what we're here to talk about tonight, uh, which is the draft height map. I have a blow-up of schools in this uh, scenario. So the school. I didn't hear. I was waiting until you finished that. Finish yeah. So we met with uh, DPS, talked about the schools, but they really have their own uh, goals about schools. So we have some policies about partnering with DPS to provide um, job training and uh, early education, and making sure that it's safe for children to get to the schools and things like that. But as far as what the schools are doing, that's. Really I'm talking about capacity. So right. So that's more people in there. Right, so actually a lot of the schools, as I said, we met with DPS, a lot of the schools in this area are seeing declines in... No, that's not uh, true. I'm just in Central, where the schools aren't seeing that, but in, uh, like Capitol Hill, those schools are seeing declines in population. Uh, so as I said, we, we worked with DPS, they reviewed the documents, uh, and we'll continue to work with them to make sure that everything works. Hey, so, uh, 
Again, we're, we're here tonight uh, to talk about primarily height and density, and then let me get through this and then we can get to the questions. And then at these future meetings, we can get into other things. Um, <clears throat> so, height map, this is the draft height map. Uh, I have a blow up of Congress Park I'll get to on the next slide, but just a couple points I want to make here. Uh, one is, if you can see these uh, pink outlines, those are the only areas where we are recommending increases in allowed height. Um, and so you'll notice, I know on a previous version of the map, the map that uh, is currently on the website and that was in those flyers, uh, it showed up to five stories at 12th and Madison and 12th and Elizabeth. We've heard from the community that that's not appropriate. Uh, so we've taken those recommendations off. Those are off the table. So all of the places where we are recommending increases in height uh, in Congress Park are right along Colfax Avenue. There's really just uh, like five places where they would be allowed additional height. One of those is the hospital, which really already now has um, basically unlimited height. Uh, they have full special zoning that allows them to go uh, very high. So it's really these four, four locations, and again, I'll blow this up. But the point is, um, in order to get that additional height, the property owners would have to offer uh, community benefits. And so we don't want to just give away the additional height. Uh, we want to make sure that the community is getting something in return. And based on all our conversations with the community, uh, we have sort of four things that we would be looking for in what those community benefits would be. One of those is affordable housing. Uh, one of those is providing publicly accessible private open space. Uh, so providing like a courtyard or a pocket park on part of their development. Uh, one of those is for preserving a historic building. Um, so the idea is if a, a historic building is landmarked, they can potentially transfer some of their available height that's not being used to another site, uh, another site to get up still to these maximum heights. So they won't be able to go above what these maximums are, but that can be a community benefit to get to these maximum heights. And then another is uh, affordable commercial space. We know that uh, rents are going up and some businesses are being pushed out. Uh, and we want to make sure that there's still space to provide those uh, community serving businesses. So that's the idea uh, for where we would allow additional height. And again, this is the policy document that would be looked to if one of these property owners came in and requested additional height through a rezoning. And then to get a rezoning, they still have to go through a public process, uh, public hearings before planning board and city council, and it's ultimately city council that makes that decision. So as I said, this is the blow up of uh, the Congress Park section of the map. Uh, the majority of the neighborhood is what is currently allowed, uh, zone single unit and two unit, and allows about uh, 35 feet or about two and a half stories, so that would stay the same. Uh, up close to the Colfax, it's zoned uh, either row house or multi-unit and allows up to three stories. So that would stay the same. And then along Colfax, it varies right now uh, between three and five, and there's just a couple places where eight stories is allowed. Uh, so for the most part, that would stay the same as what it is currently zoned for, which again is not what is currently built. A lot of times what is built is less than what the current zone would allow. So when you see a one-story building on Colfax, that doesn't mean that's all that's allowed to be there. Oftentimes, it's three, five, or even eight stories that could be there under the current zoning uh, that exists. But the idea is uh, just in these areas outlined in pink, where additional height over what the current zoning allows could be granted. Um, and that would, again, be only if those community benefits were offered. So in some places, it goes up to uh, from three stories to five stories if they provide that community benefit. In some places, it goes from five stories up to eight stories. Uh, and then in some places, from eight stories up to 12 stories, but as I mentioned, the main 12-story area is uh, National Jewish Hospital, which really already has its own, um, its own special zone. So, so, this is Colfax here. Um, this is York, Colorado, uh, 6th. And then uh, I can come back to this when we get to questions and, and point out specific things. Uh, and then another question was uh, density and adding density in the existing residential areas. So again, we heard from the community that a major goal was preserving the character of the neighborhood. 
Uh, you don't like it when these uh, old historic houses get torn down and a big new box gets put in its place. Uh, so we have recommendations about uh, residential design guidelines to try to solve some of those problems with new houses so that they're better neighbors, they look better, they fit in better uh, when that does happen. But we also wanted to come up with tools to discourage that from happening, to encourage people to keep their existing house. And the tool we have come up with, again, working with the steering committee, working with the community, working with our consultants, is to offer an incentive to allow an additional unit if you keep your house. So if you uh, want to maximize the value of your house, right now the thing to do, or the value of your property, right now the thing to do is tear it down, build a big new house. Uh, with this policy, the best thing you could do would be to keep your house and potentially add a, a small addition, a subordinate addition in the back, uh, but potentially subdivide that house into two units. Uh, so you could have two families living in that, that same house, but it would still fit in with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, so that's the idea for that policy. Uh, and then, it's not allowed in R0. Right, this would be a new policy uh, that would be a uh, new law. This is a proposal. Right. Please, don't speak out of here. So, as I mentioned, uh, we intend to have the public review draft out in October. We'll have that public uh, open house. And then, uh, either late this year or early next year, uh, we're hoping to get to the planning board and city council. Uh, this is our website down here, uh, denvergov.org slash plan. You can go there, uh, find more information. Right now, the information on there is a bit out of date. It's from the May workshop we held. Uh, as I said, we're working very busily right now to create the draft plan. Once that's available, it will be on that website, uh, hopefully in early October. Uh, you can also sign up for email alerts on there. Uh, there's a button in the top right. Um, and so you'll be notified uh, for the, the public workshop and for uh, that draft plan when it comes out. If you want to be notified about the upcoming October or upcoming Congress Park meetings, uh, we recommend going to the we recommend we recommend going to the uh, Congress Park website. Uh, they'll be the ones advertising those Congress Park specific meetings. Uh, my contact information is also on this website. Uh, so if you have questions after this, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, my email is on that website. I, I want to put a point of emphasis on one thing she said about the upcoming meeting. So Miles, who's your representative from Congress Park, has invited us to do three additional just Congress Park meetings, and we're working to set those up uh, next month, probably mid to late September. It's looking like we're still working on the dates. Um, and so if you're interested in going to those Congress Park specific meetings, you'll need to go to the Congress Park website or social media to get that information when it's available. Okay, that's all I had. Uh, so I think we're ready for questions. Okay, so I see a lot of new faces here. There are a lot of faces that I've seen. Okay. Um, and so we know there's a lot of people that know what's going on. Um, we're going to go numeric in this list as the people who have been coming to the meetings. Most of them arrive early. Your questions will probably get answered by questions that are going to be asked by other residents. But everybody that did sign in, you were given a number. Uh, when it comes time, um, I want you to state your number your name, and what your home address is here in the Congress Park. And we're going to limit these to 90 seconds. You want to be out. If you're a resident, we'll share your address. Um, if, if you don't, then you can wait. You can go to the other neighborhood meetings, the ones that are not just Congress Park specific. I will say this. If you don't want to give out your address to give out your number, just wait a second. We'll look you up on the list. Thank you. 
Okay, number one. No one? Number one? Number two? Do you have a name? No, I would just let if people want to speak, why don't they just say their number and I'll have a list. Yeah, okay. So if you don't remember your number, come see me and I'll remind you. Sorry, yeah. Why wait to sign in? 16, Michael Rebecca. So, a couple questions. We talked about the. Took away 12, which is great, so thank you from the whole land of all. We get a map every single month of the crime rates around Congress Park, and it's getting better and better every month. And all the crime is on the outskirts because that's where a lot of the high density is. What is our plan around crime when we increase the housing and all that stuff on Colfax where the crime comes straight into Congress Park? Yeah, so the plan does include uh, recommendations for um, safety, uh, reducing crime. Uh, again, I don't want to get into those tonight, um, but we, we do, the plan does address that. We do have recommendations for uh, reducing crime, improving safety. Um, Are you going to email those details out so we can see them? They, they will be in the draft plan when that gets released. Uh, again, we're still finalizing those, and, uh, but they, they will be in the plan. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, number four. Um, why isn't parking a part of the community benefits list? Um, so, when we've been going through this process, we've uh, heard uh, mixed opinions on parking. Uh, certainly, we know parking uh, is an issue, uh, and a lot of people um, have to park on the street uh, because they don't have off street parking. And that could be a problem. Uh, but we've also heard from quite a few folks uh, that they don't want to see more parking, uh, that more parking leads to more traffic uh, and creates more problems. And so there wasn't a clear community uh, consensus that additional parking was a community benefit. Uh, as I said, these four things that were on the previous slide really came up through the community of, of things that people, everybody said they wanted, everybody said they valued. Uh, and that's why we want to include those as community benefits. Uh, the, the parking requirements in the zoning code uh, still apply. Uh, we have other recommendations about uh, sharing parking or providing additional uh, parking along Colfax to uh, reduce the spillover effect into the neighborhood. We know that's an issue. Uh, so there are recommendations in the plan addressing parking, uh, but that's why it was not a community benefit. Uh, yes, sir. Um. 168, I live at 1265 Detroit Street. Can you talk a little bit about um, what is the difference about what you're proposing for a second unit at the back of the house versus a granny flat above the garage? I mean, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so uh, the citywide plans that I mentioned that were adopted earlier this year, they included recommendations to allow uh, what we call accessory dwelling units, also known as uh, granny flats or carriage houses, that uh, additional unit in the back of the house, uh, recommendations to allow those everywhere in the city. Uh, so there is a, a city policy to, over the next few years, uh, adopt an amendment to the zoning code that will allow uh, these accessory dwelling units everywhere in the city. Regardless of lot size? We'll, we're working out the details. It's uh, high level policy now. We'll go through a, a process. We'll work with the public to figure out exactly what that looks like. Uh, so we don't have those kind of details yet. But that's a citywide policy to allow accessory dwelling units across the city. Uh, this um, recommendation would be on top of that. So uh, potentially, if someone took advantage of this and took advantage of the accessory dwelling unit policy, they could have uh, this two units in the original house and then an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, so potentially up to three units. We don't expect. That made people to take advantage of that. It's not like it's going to triple the, the population of the neighborhood. Um, and we'll be, again, achieving these community goals uh, for preservation of care. Uh, yes, sir.
and for the developers and the people in Park Hill and Lowry because the business is stuck anyways. That will help with parking and traffic. Create a light rail line from I-25 in Colorado down this way down to the Colfax. part of your question as far as uh, transit on Colorado, uh, along with the citywide plans that were adopted earlier this year, there's a plan called uh, Denver Moves Transit, which includes citywide policy for uh, additional transit, and Colorado is one of the priority corridors for that. Uh, it'll likely be bus rapid transit, um, somewhat similar to what's being proposed for Colfax, instead of light rail, but uh, we do have transit plans for, uh, for Colorado. Uh, yes, ma'am. So with all of these influx of big massive units and stuff, we bring up in more people and with more cars, which creates more density in transportation. If you're putting up a bike rack, a bike trail up Garfield, you're gonna um in here what you're gonna make people mad about that you can go around. And down on Seventh Avenue, it's already dangerous. People come off of Colorado and fly down Seventh Avenue and still down Eighth Avenue. We know now you have a double turn on Eighth Avenue, which will hopefully help. But Seventh Avenue is dangerous for pedestrians, bicycles, and young kids because people want to avoid Eighth Avenue. If you're going to bring more people into Congress Park, that is going to influence the amount of people that are going to try to fly through it with a at fast speed. And then you can have a conflict with people riding their bikes. So how are you going to handle that? Yes. Um, so uh, Garfield is not the only street in Congress Park proposed for those kind of traffic calming improvements. Um, and we know 7th is a problem. We've heard that from the community. Uh, and so there are proposals for improving safety and calming traffic uh, throughout the community. Uh, we were at the, um, the Safe Streets Committee here last week. Uh, we talked with them about, mostly about Garfield, or about Front Street, sorry. Um, but we're, we've been working with uh, that group uh, and with our transportation engineers uh, to make recommendations for common traffic on many of the busy streets uh, throughout the East Central area. Uh, some plan will include recommendations to, to improve safety, calm traffic, uh, try to keep people from, from cutting through uh, like that and, and causing those problems. Yes, sir. Larry Wysocki, serial number 161. So the current density in this neighborhood area is, is approximately 12,000 people per square mile. <clears throat> now, in New York, it's 28,000. In, in the U.S. city, the average U.S. city, it's 1,600. So if you're going to bring in more people, can you give us an estimate of what? The density is going to be, is it going to go up to 20,000 people? Uh, we do have projections. I do not remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, but that information will be in the plan. We do have a projection for how many additional people we expect in the next 20 years. Are those numbers uh, accurate that you mentioned? In terms of density? Uh, there's about 50,000 people. I, uh, I did the calculation based on well, the we'll we'll across the country. I want, I want to know. Yeah, I, the census, the census I, don't, I don't know. I haven't checked those numbers, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. I actually looked into the possibly building a third house in the garage. There's no problem with the lack of infrastructure, mainly school, water, electric. So is there a plan? Yes, uh, we know that's probably now uh, there are technical issues for doing accessory dwelling units, even for the folks who want to do them. Uh, and sometimes there are financial barriers to doing that. Uh, so that will be an element of that process. We'll start in the next few years to uh, allow accessory dwelling units across the city. Uh, we'll look at these technical issues, these financial issues, and try to find ways. Um, to address those, and also looking at uh, making sure that it's not just going to be a boom for speculators, that uh, allowing accessory dwelling units, now the value goes up, people are going to come in, tear down houses and build two units. Value goes up. Uh, we're going to have policies to, to prevent that and mitigate that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, 
This plan really has. It seems like when we read about Crestmore or Sloan's Lake, that community gives input, but by the time the city council votes on a rezoning issue that's escalated, it's a done deal. So we put you put together this plan with our input. How much clout does it have if it comes to rezoning or height variance? Yeah, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, when a property, when a rezoning request comes in, there are five criteria that have to be met. The first criterion is consistency with adopted plans. So that's really the first thing we look at is, is the proposal consistent with adopted plans? Uh, sometimes there's not a, an adopted plan, and that creates problems. There's just the same white plan, and it's very vague in general. Uh, this will provide more specificity and more detail uh, so uh, it will provide that guidance for future rezonings to say uh, what is appropriate, what are the appropriate heights. Um, and that's the information that we provide to city council who then makes the final decision on whether to approve the rezoning. So just follow up, city council, how much do you listen to this plan when you vote yes on rezoning? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> You're a friendly bunch. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Yes, get your voters. Um, so uh, you have a, a really good point, and part of the reason why there have been so many zoning variances lately is because we haven't had, um, you know, Blueprint's 20 years old, the comp plan is 20 years old, we've had eight dated plans, and um, uh, so not that it matters in Congress Park, but in District 10, uh, Country Club and Spear have never had a neighborhood plan. And so, um, the, the more recent the plan, the more important, the uh, the more weight that we have. And we just passed Blueprint, we just passed the comp plan, and those are in late April, early May. And uh, and then we're in the process of working on this as well. So we'll have three plans that are all passed in the span of about six months or a year, depending on, we want to make sure that everyone's engaged, right? And thank you for, uh, by the way, thank you for coming, because um, this document is meant to be uh, uh, written down the relationship between the government, which I guess me, you, and developers. And so we want to make sure that, that we document that relationship. And then once we have it on paper and we have the community input, then we say, this is it. We shouldn't be doing any zoning variances because this was the conversation that we had. We had the documentation. And, you know, so the stuff that was 20 years old, that was, you know, people who are here now weren't here when those documents were created. But now that all these documents are fresh, like, it's... I was here. I was here. I was here. Uh, we were all here. I wrote. I didn't see that, but, um, just, I, I hope that answers your question, but I mean, the idea is we would have no zoning experience with, with, uh, with a strong document that documents government developers and the neighbors and the relationship and the agreement between all three. Oh, I was looking at an interesting map that I hadn't seen before. Someone was showing it to me, and I just wanted to make sure that it was a, we could get it on that website. It's the character and preservation map that shows what houses um, can become more than single-family homes. Yes, that map is on the website. Um, but as I mentioned, we are currently updating things, uh -huh. uh, so that map will likely change uh, before it goes into the, the draft plan. So okay. that map is okay. available on the website. Yes, ma'am. question about along 13th and 14th, uh, those recommendations haven't changed, so I'm not sure what uh, map you were looking at, but that 
That should still be the same. So the heights are still high on no, 13th and 14th? Just to clarify, there's never been a recommendation right. for increased height at 13th, on 13th and 14th Street. So but I've right. seen the map too, and yes, it was. It, and it wasn't developed by us. This yeah. is probably the height is different. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always been this sort of light lavender purple color. Um, it says up to three stories uh, between 13th and 14th. It's on the website. Yeah, it's on the website. Yes, 13th and 14th up to uh, well, Garfield. Up to 12 stories. I'm, I'm yeah. looking at 12 stories. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right on Colorado? No, Colorado. on uh, 13th and 14th on the corners. Of Colfax? No. No. Garfield. On the corners. On 13th and 14th. Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Colorado to Garfield. All of those That's corners the right. get. What is it, 13 story? 12 story. 12 right. story. So that's that's the hospital property. As I said, they have their own special zoning. It's already allowed uh, to go up that high. So, sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Uh, yes, that block between. Yes. Uh, so, um, sorry, your original question uh, on that block between 13th and 14th. Colorado and Garfield, uh, that's the hospital property. Uh, so that also hasn't changed. It still has the up to 12 stories. As far as the additional density, uh, the idea is to allow one additional unit. So if you're single unit zoning, that would allow you to go to two units. If you're two unit zoning, that would allow you to go to three units. Uh, if you have multi-unit zoning or row house zoning, uh, it would allow you to add one additional unit. We haven't worked out the details of how that would be uh, triggered, um, but that is the idea for uh, the so explain the that if you have five units in a row, you would allow you would be that are currently attached. Somebody could come in and build a sixth unit or another five units. Uh, it would be a sixth unit. Again, we haven't worked out the details of how that would work, um, but that's the idea: is one additional unit uh, for the the property. The, the zone. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so. More specifically, just in terms of the auxiliary uh, dwelling units, you have the incentive concerns me. I'm just wondering what's to keep somebody from selling to a developer uh, an existing house who won't change it, but is going to, to uh, upscale as part of the, the development, and then that person's going to resell it. Rather than, I mean, it seems like part of the idea of keeping a neighborhood together is the incentive to stay there, not not to keep the house. More broadly, one of the things that I have missed, and I'd like to see if you can, you can uh, just backtracking, there is an assumption about density and uh, an increase in density, and that it's just assumed that that's going to happen. And I understand, in a sense, what that is, but it also seems to me to be. Uh, something around the city government value that it should increase, that that's one of the things that makes a great city is more more people to come in and to make that available. And I wanted to know if, if what's the, the philosophical background about that and the value proposition, particularly in terms of quality of, quality of life in that assumption. So to your first question about um, speculators coming in, uh, that is definitely a concern. Uh, the intent is to have uh, protections in the regulations, the recommendations in the plan to try to discourage that. We can't necessarily stop that. Um, but looking at um, make, potentially making it so that uh, a property owner has to live in one of the units, uh, similar to what's required for accessory dwelling units now, uh, so that it couldn't just be a, a landlord somewhere else renting out the two units on the property. Um, so potentially something like that or other tools uh, we would look to develop to try to discourage that. As far as uh, growth in the city generally, uh, as was talked about, we have adopted these new uh, citywide plans that uh, look at how the city should grow and change over the next 20 years. And it does call for additional growth and does call for um, trying to accommodate uh, more than our share of regional growth in the city because it meets uh, the city's goals for inclusivity, uh, for um, uh, resiliency, for uh, impact on the climate, 
Uh, we have all these broad goals. I recommend looking at the comprehensive plan. Uh, it has these really broad goals for how we want this city to operate. Uh, and as described in those citywide plans, accommodating uh, more people, especially in areas around transit, uh, where they don't have to be reliant on cars uh, and have access to uh, all the amenities and services they need uh, helps meet those city like goals. But specifically in terms of, of growth, you know, just the, the assumption that 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 uh, that we're going to have more people here. I understand the pressures for that, but it's but there's a value assumption that I don't know that we where where has the input been on that fundamental value assumption right. been? As I said, that's people? that's in that citywide plan. So look at comprehensive plan and blueprint Denver, and they talk about um, accommodating growth in the city and the values of that. Who? So, but who? So what is just, just so all cities that are desirable that people want to live in grow, right? And so no, that's my question. So again, cities that people want to move to. I don't know of any city that doesn't allow people to move to them. But cities that people want to move to generally grow. Having to make Please. all of us change. Yeah. So I'm trying to answer this gentleman's question. Yes, so the the projections we are seeing from the state and other organizations project that the city of Denver will continue to grow. And so the plans that we have in place are is trying to guide that in a way that will help benefit the city. Right? So one of the aspects that's relevant to this plan is trying to guide growth into areas where there's more high capacity transit, for example. Um, where people can get around without necessarily increasing traffic congestion. So that's kind of in a nutshell our uh, our strategy for dealing with some of the growth that's occurring. Yes, ma'am, Lynn back. Yes, Sorry, I'm a little bit. Speak up, please. Uh, yes, we had that question earlier. Uh, as I said then, uh, we've been talking with DPS and working with DPS uh, about this. Um, they are responsible for providing uh, places for the children in the city. Uh, so we've been working with them to make sure that can happen appropriately, uh, but it's really DPS's responsibility. Deep, deep, wait, just say DPS's planners use the exact same population projections we are using in this plan. So we're we're, we're, we're basing the same data on these decisions of DPS. So is, is, that, is it discussed in the plan or is it separate as a DPS document? We, we can't tell DPS to build more schools, but they are using the same population projections we're using. Do so they operate in the Yes, yes. they operate in the Yes, ma'am. Hi, Lisa Hagemeyer, 13th and Cook. Um, will you have a recommendation along with the ADU recommendation to restrict people from using their ADUs 100% of the time um, for Airbnb? Uh, yes. Uh, the current regulations in the city say that uh, you have to live in the Airbnb unit. Right, so you've probably seen them in the news a couple of times. Is it considered part of the entire lot or is it considered a separate unit? My understanding is it's considered a separate unit. I mean, separate I think you really so. need to clarify that so that if you need to make a separate right, that's, recommendation and plan. That's a good point. Uh, we'll the, cur the current draft recommendation in the city central plan is that any increase that a property owner would take advantage of for an additional unit would not be allowed at a, a, a short term rental. That's what the draft recommendation says. Yes, sir. Uh, Tony Smith and uh, number 133, we live at Colfax and Madison. Um, and one of the key issues uh, that you raised in the beginning was historic and neighborhood character preservation. And living on Colfax, we absolutely love how approachable every single building is, and that's five stories or less. So my questions are, um, how are those particular places chosen to, be, to go up to eight, potentially, but then also, what can we do to help guide that, just like our community guided to get rid of 12th and Madison increasing? So we'll, how can we be constructive in that process? Um, yeah, so the first part, how are those very selective? Uh, we used a few different criteria. Um, one of them was the size of the lot. Um, a lot of, as you probably know, a lot of the lots along Colfax are very uh, shallow, very small, and can't actually be developed to that height. 
Uh, part of that was proximity to uh, transit, so we have a general idea of where the BRT stations will be on Colfax, so we wanted to try to concentrate density around those. Uh, part of it was looking at uh, potentially historic buildings. So we looked at, uh, sort of did a survey of the buildings up and down Colfax and picked out the ones that uh, had character that people seemed to like, uh, and we tried to avoid those to try not to incentivize people to tear those down and build it until they put in there. Um, and so those were generally the, the criteria we looked at for that. And just to get to your point, in the Congress Park neighborhood, so within Congress Park on Colfax, there's only one property that we're proposing go above five stories. There's another, and that's uh, I think the Paradise Clearance, the Paradise Clearance property. And there's this other property that was already zoned at eight stories, which we're we're asking the question, should that go up an additional height category, which is 12, for these additional feeding benefits? How can we rally for Paradise Cleaners to stay at five? An eight-story building destroys that avenue. I don't know if you realize all the tall eight stories. If you put an eight-story building in the center of Congress Park, it wipes out the character of that. And that's, so that's that's a question we're asking. So again, this is not a set in stone. We're, we're, what we're saying is the question we're asking is some of these properties can can be developed today at like you know five stories, three stories without community benefits that we that we described, right? And we've heard that some of these are valuable historic preservation, open space, affordable housing. So the question we're asking is for additional control over development, there's an incentive proposal to allow some additional height for additional control of the new efforts. We don't have to do that. We can allow people to develop at the current at their current zoning. That's an option, right? And so what we like to hear is you asked about how do we be constructive. Um, we want to make sure that we're meeting the community values and the goals that we heard earlier in the process. So one was maintaining the character of the neighborhood. So some of your, some of your comments were on, on that point. That's what really drove us taking a second look at 12, because those neighborhood nodes are highly valuable. They're former streetcar nodes. They're working well today. We, did, we actually did a walking analysis early in the process where we actually scored each of those mixed use centers. And the lots are very close to lower density, and they're very small. So a lot of those factors led us to make the decision that that's not really meeting the goals of the plan, right? And so we do have a goal on Colfax, which is different from 12, where there's a planned high capacity transit infrastructure, where there's a citywide goal to, to try to increase density along those corridors. And so we're treating Colfax a little differently than the corridor on 12. But that doesn't mean that we can't make changes at this point. So I would encourage you to stay involved in the process and give us that feedback. Could you recognize this woman, please? She's yes, had her sure. hand. I had a, Eileen Saris, Colton Jackson, number 12. Um, I had a comment and then I had a couple of questions. So a comment about, it seems like a lot of this development is predicated upon rapid transit coming in. That's how you selected some of the areas for increased density. What if that doesn't happen? And so it seems kind of like we're doing it a little bit out of whack, that maybe we should put the infrastructure in first build the roads, build the schools, build whatever it is, the transit stations, figure out where those are actually going to be before you're, you start get, having incentives for development around potential centers for transit that may or may not happen. So that's my comment. And then my question is, to be very specific about what areas, since you've changed the map a little bit, so we would like to get a list of what that those exact areas are, because it's really hard to see on this map in the room. Um, and sort of why, what are these financial incentives? What makes a lot of people nervous in this room is that lack of clarity. And that, um, you know, who's to say someone comes in and with an ADU scrapes it and, you know, they've got, or, or somebody with a single family house, a developer buys it, scrapes it, and they're able to put however many units they need, depending on what existing zoning is there and run an Airbnb or whatever it is they want to do. I mean, there are ways through zoning and covenants to protect people from that. But we're not hearing that. We're just hearing financials and incentives. We're going to work it out later. Yeah. Let's get the infrastructure in first. Let's get the schools built. Mm -hmm. Let's get the infrastructure. And let RTD decide where they put those transit stations. They may end up not putting them where your plan is, and they move them a few blocks over, and we're going to be like, huh, that's not working. So why, what's the rush 
on the plan when we have so many unknowns. To the point about timing, I, I think that's a, that's a good comment. We've heard that. Um, we, we're developing language. So at, as Scott said at the beginning, this is a long-term policy guide. It's not zoning. It guides them. And so what we're considering as we're making this draft plan is addressing that point and basically saying that, yes, there's a policy. This is the general guidance along Colfax. However, the zoning that would be implementing that should not take effect until there's more certainty around the funding for Colfax BRT, for example, and there's more certainty about where those stations are. So we're working on that draft language to address that issue. But how about the infrastructure first? Let's have it built. I mean, just saying we have an insurance that there's going to be money, it might be delayed. Um, you know, there's not there's not a lot of federal money for infrastructure. So what's, I mean, to me, put the, let's get the infrastructure in first. We're the sixth most dense neighborhood out of 88 in Denver. It seems to me we are dense. And, there, and let's wait and see what RTD is able to do, what the city is able to do, because it may really tweak that map considerably enough that we would have wished we would have had that, because we could make better decisions. And this is about making decisions for the neighborhood and for everyone. And I think Scott said, ADUs, you kind of slipped and said, well, maybe an ADU wouldn't be affordable because an investor could come in. And that's what we're worried about. The same thing that you say that this is about creating affordability may in fact not create affordability. It may actually work against that. So that's what we're concerned about. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Jim William, a uh, little bit more people. Uh, and I'm a former uh, Congress Park neighbor president. Uh, one of the problems that we uh, tried to deal with and did not succeed is how to retain the character of the lavender areas, which were uh, in uh, uh, you see them, yeah. uh, which were uh, developed single family initially in the 60s and 70s, a lot of rip up, put a, a five square apartment with the surrounding parking just up the neighborhood. Um, and the remedy for that is very complicated and difficult. Uh, have you thought about that? How to preserve the character of the lavender areas, the areas that were both single family have been trashed a bit uh, over the decades and need to be uh, attended to in the future. Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the recommendations will be to develop uh, design guidelines for these areas, so including the lavender areas, uh, to make sure that uh, new buildings or changes to existing buildings uh, fit in with that character and, and enhance the character instead of the character. Uh, and will you define the character in the same way that we <laughs> will work with the community to develop those and so I mean, uh, these historic single family, large single family. Okay. So there, there will be uh, some high level recommendations in the plan of, of what we've heard through this process of what people like about existing houses and what should be preserved. Uh, and then there will be a separate process after, again, um, and where we'll again work with the community to, to refine those and really define what those design guidelines should be. This man. My name is Kathleen Allen, and I live at 1270 Cook Street, and um, I have a couple things I want to bring up. Uh, one is that it is already very dense in our neighborhood, and uh, oftentimes there's no place to park in that. The apartment building, there's a apartment building on 13th and Cook, and they charge extra to use the garage. How do we keep new buildings from doing that? Who say, yeah, we'll only charge you fifteen hundred dollars for the apartment, but you're going to have to pay for your electricity. You're going to have to pay for your um, parking, just the parking, and your parking. You have to pay for it. So, so, so they go, wow, you know, I can afford a fifteen hundred dollar apartment, but the, the, the parking, I can't afford that. I can't afford to pay that parking. So I'm just going to park on the street. And that's, that happens all over the 
city. Good point. And there are some um, apartment buildings that have been purchased, I mean, that have been built, that don't allow for a unit, each unit, to have a parking spot. I'll need to, under the assumption that um, a lot of people don't have cars, but a lot of people do. And so we end up with the traffic, you know, um, on 12th Avenue. You, if you get home, like tonight when I go home, I'll probably park on 11th and walk all the way down because there's no parking. And as you build up on the coal tracks, it's going to get more and more like that. So that's number one. Number two is, and we're talking about values. Why must the people of Congress Park and the East Central Denver Plan, why are we being um, subject, subjected to more density? Why are we? I mean, we were here. We have a dense neighborhood. We have a nice neighborhood. Why do we have to make it more dense? Why do we have to take a house and prove allow houses to be divided in half? Why do we have to allow um, additional units in the back? I mean, why? Why are we suggesting these things? Why don't we do this, you know, as we are one of the densest neighbors in the city. Why are we doing that in this neighborhood? Um, so, two answers to that, and then I'll go back to the first part about parking. Uh, one is, again, the citywide plans call for every neighborhood in the city accommodating additional people. Even Montbello? Every neighborhood in the city. Uh, every neighborhood is every neighborhood in the city. Yeah, we know how that works. So, so we, we're trying to call, please, right down. So the question is, how do we accommodate that perfectly? And uh, the second part is, Again, one of the things we've heard from the community that they really value is the character of the neighborhood. Uh, so this policy to um, allow an additional unit if the, the house is preserved uh, was really created as a character preservation tool. Uh, it happens to increase density and allow uh, additional people to enjoy this wonderful neighborhood. But the real intent of that policy is to preserve character uh, that we've heard everyone says they want. Uh, so back to your first question about parking. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, yes, well, we've heard parking concerns. There will be parking recommendations in the plan. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about and are looking at is uh, parking permits that are uh, limited for uh, homeowners or single family and not uh, multi-unit developments to Present, prevent that exact problem where um, you know they have to pay additional parking and so now they park on the street. Uh, but if they can't get a parking permit, then they would have to pay that parking. So uh, we are aware of these problems and we are uh, developing recommendations to address them. The commercial lets their their employees. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, uh, going back to the issue of value that several people have mentioned. Uh, I moved to this neighborhood 43 years ago. Mm -hmm. Raised my kids here, and one of the things I liked was the R0 zone. And the large density. So it seems to me that we have our new, I know this is a plant, it's not so new, but it's a plant that will direct this over. It's eliminating our zero in there. And specifically, the recommendations. Let's not so, so R0 was eliminated nine years ago when the city adopted the new zoning code. Um, yeah, we were surprised by that. Uh, so, uh, can, you, can you define R0? For yeah, it's just single family zone. Right. It's very, Isn't there a height max to? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know the details of the old R0. So, do you see what's happening? It's um, when we did okay. our construction and we wanted to do something we wanted to put, we had to jump all kinds of hoops. And now I, you know, green zone, the racials, green space, do whatever. And now I can just build something and put in my garage. There will be. There will be. We are not going to be part of the Yes. There will be regulations for the accessory development. 
months, you won't be able to just start building. You'll have to get a permit. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'll work with the communities in the city to develop those regulations so that they're compatible with the difference. May uh, I? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've lived here since 19... 78, I've seen all sorts of changes, okay? Helped write that 1995 plan with a vision that we have all committed to by living here and having our families here. Now, we, a lot of these lots are very narrow or relatively narrow. You have a citywide policy to add units, but it doesn't seem to take into account the fact that we have narrow lots, we have limited parking, and so our values are preservation, family-oriented, and, and uh, enjoying the character of a close-in neighborhood that we all enjoy. So why is it then that this citywide policy would be imposed in the same way as in maybe some of the other neighborhoods that have larger lots and so forth. So it just seems to me that you're not respecting by using a citywide policy on this already dense neighborhood. Right. So, so that's uh, my the policy won't be <laughs> policy won't be the same across the city. Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier that will develop regulations, uh, and they will vary by zone district, by neighborhood, um, to make sure that they're compatible. Um, so it won't be the same on small lots as it is in large lots uh, way out in um, but th But three units on my, where my house is would pretty much change the character of the neighborhood substantially. <laughs> you, know. you, would, you would have to keep your existing house. So you wouldn't be able to build a, a three and, and divide it up like it right. used to be. I mean, many of exactly. these houses around here used to be many yeah. multiple exactly. units. You know? So there's a there's a history of this in this neighborhood. And that's what we changed. But we don't want to go back. Thank you. Right. Okay. Yes, ma'am, and back. Yes. not take these into account. That development was approved uh, long before we developed these recommendations. Uh, these recommendations are developed just for this plan, and we also are planning uh, the neighborhoods on that side of Colorado. So uh, we're developing what's called the East Area Plan, which is neighborhoods uh, from Colorado to Yosemite along Colfax. Uh, so we're also working on planning that area right now. Uh, we know that area is also being developed, so we're taking that into account. Uh, but that development was approved uh, many years ago, uh, and so did not have these, these things taken into account. But, but I guess the question is, is there a reason to wait to see what is that, you know, how much of the need is fulfilled by that development? Uh, as I said, we have the citywide policy, uh, citywide goals for uh, how many people we're going to accommodate in the city in the next 20 years. Uh, I can. I don't know exactly how many units are being built at night in Colorado. I can promise you it's not enough to accommodate. Let me, let me put a point of emphasis on, the, I think the question you're asking is, why do we, you know, are we just trying to accommodate growth with this policy? And that's not the intent. Here's the question, I just want to put a point on this. The question we're asking the community with this additional unit draft recommendation that we're still taking comments on is, would you like the trade-off, do you support the trade-off of losing a development right to gain a development right? So the development right you would lose is you would lose the right to demolish the house, right? Yeah. If you exercise the option, you lose that right. Still you can still demolish it. No, the, so there's some confusion here. So what the, the draft recommendation would, would say 
is that you, you will now have an option to develop one additional unit if you lose the right to demolish the house. That, that, if, you, if you still want to demolish your house, you can, but you would not be allowed to rebuild an additional unit. You'd only be allowed to rebuild one unit. Does everyone understand? That's the question we're asking. And yes, there are trade-offs. And what that what that draft recommendation came out of was two community values primary that we heard. One is we want to preserve houses, so it's a historic preservation incentive. That's what it's trying to accomplish from a community values perspective. And second, there is a community value to allow some more more affordable units compared to what the units are today. So typically, a smaller unit is less expensive. So those are the community values that we're, we are responding to with this draft recommendation. We're asking you, yes, there's a trade-off. There would be a, some additional density in the neighborhood, but there would also be the community benefit of historic preservation and some more affordable units. That's the question we're asking. I just want to clarify a point on zoning. A lot of the houses here already could add an ADU depending on the lot size. Because your lot size has to be big enough. What is dramatically different, and some people can then build a duplex. I mean, we already have the ability to do increased you get density. You get, you get right, so it's an additional one. So, and people aren't taking advantage of that because right. we're already pretty dense. So it, to say that you can't, to say to stipulate it the way that you are, you have to predicate it with, in some of the areas here, they can already do that. Well, the, I think the point is they can. Yes, they can. can. And but this they're going to do an additional one. Yeah, yeah, but this would uh, yeah. control it. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. The question is, they can, yes, in many of our neighborhoods throughout the city can build an additional unit, and they're not building an additional unit. So we don't expect everyone to take advantage of this option, because many neighborhoods don't. Because they can today, and we're not seeing people. It's, it's really just a, it's an option. I do have a comment and, and a kind of a question and an ask because I'm feeling like our schools are getting woefully <coughs> glossed over. And you made a comment that I, I found to be quite preposterous having a child at the one elementary school that goes from Colorado, Josephine, 8th to 26th and encompasses a majority of what we're talking about, and that is Teller Elementary. And how I am hearing your experience working with DPS seems to be very much like, well, this is our plan and we're talking with them. It's not up to us to really help them raise funds to build more schools. We're letting them figure that out. That is really concerning to me, seeing that we are you know, discussing change and growth and density. And I see a lot of families and a lot of kids moving into those purple buildings. And right now at Teller Elementary, these kids are practically falling out of the windows. So I don't know where you're getting. Thank you. Thank you. Enrollment is beyond up. And I don't know where that information came from that that you know encouraged you to make a comment like it's going down. Bromwell Elementary is the other school that is nearby, but none of us fall into that. So could you please give a little bit more context around your relationship specifically with Teller, DPS uh, in general, and moving forward, how that relationship and those conversations with our one local elementary school 
and this isn't even encompassing East High School, um, is going to look. Yeah, so I think what, what Scott either misspoke or, or was talking about is the East Central area encompasses many schools. Right, and so in some in some of the schools in this yeah, area, I, I'm talking specifically I know, I know, about. I'm talking about what was said earlier. So some of the schools do have an enrollment problem. You're right. Commerce Park does not have a enrollment problem. Commerce Park is going up. So in our conversations with DPS planners, we are working off of the same population projections that they are working off of that they use to plan additional facilities. If, if, but we're take, we're taking comments. If this is if we if you need some more assurances that. Um, DPS is supportive of what we're doing. We can we can circle back with them and make sure that we are closely aligned, and we'll take that feedback. If that's the right plan, your plan. Okay. Dan Bronson, Milwaukee, number one eighty six. Large part of the bottom is the Seventh Avenue Historic District. It's not reflected in this plan at all. So why not? Um, again, this is not the entire plan. Uh, there are other recommendations. But shouldn't it be shown in the plan along with everything else? Because it has its own requirements and its own restrictions. And I think it should be talked about. It is talked about. It is talked about in the plan. Uh, and we were asked tonight to talk about height and density, not uh, historic regulations. So come to the, uh, the upcoming meetings, come to the, the open house in October to uh, review the draft plan. Uh, we're over time. I live at uh, Trump and Josephine, and I'm a real estate broker too. And one thing that I notice is as some of the suburban areas continue to grow, we've got more people trying to get downtown through Josephine York, coming down Colorado Boulevard, cutting through. Um, it's just the traffic's getting crazier and crazier. So, one of the things I'm concerned about is we add more density here, now we've got more traffic. And something that, that's always kind of bothered me is that I've got a daughter, she's now 24, but she grew up in that neighborhood. And we have something so cool, but you can't hardly use it, and that is, think about it, we've got City Park with the zoo and all of that right there. We now have a new rec center right there. We've got Cheeseman, we've got Cherry Creek, we've got Congress Park, we've got all of that on one road. And it, and it ties into the Cherry Creek bike path. If that was walkable and bikeable, a person could come downtown to, you know, uh, they're, they're having a meeting downtown. They could hop on a bike. They could ride a bike all the way up through the path, and they could go and stop at Botanical Gardens, go and go to City Park. But the traffic is so bad and it's so dense, a kid could not even go from Botanical Gardens to City Park without risking their lives. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, long term, what can we do to make that whole area, instead of more dense, how can we become more walkable, more bikeable, for air quality, for lifestyle, for everything? How can we become actually more walkable in that sort of thing? Yes, absolutely, great points. Um, there are recommendations in the plan to improve walkability, bikeability, uh, safety for those modes. Um, to do exactly what you're talking about. To, to, there are all these great assets around here. Um, and then he talks about all that traffic coming in, cutting through from right. what? From, so, you know, from Highlands Ranch and right. <coughs> so the plan also includes recommendations for traffic calming, uh, to slow that traffic down and try to divert it around the neighborhood instead of cutting through the neighborhood. Uh, but to your larger point about people from the suburbs and the outskirts of the city uh, driving through the neighborhood, uh, by providing additional housing here, that prevents people from moving to Aurora and driving to So, to answer more of your question, sir, back here again, mobility, sir, sir, yes. The mobility that you're questioning, the mo the the survey, and that was done by the Safe Streets Committee, is available online. Okay. All of the information about the high impact areas is in that report, and there are also recommendations on what can be done. What I would suggest is you check out the report, what has been recommended, and then you can submit your recommendations 
to the plan specific oh, to what you were speaking I actually to. talked to Hickmover years ago about it. <laughs> 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 Please come to the upcoming meetings where we'll actually talk about the mobility issues specifically. I need to leave, so sorry. My time has been rising a long time already. Um, I moved less than two years ago to that neighborhood, but for the same reasons, some ladies say why they love to live here. So I fall in love with the neighborhood for what it is today. Um, I live in Garfield Street. What I can see from the plan, I look at the website, is that unfortunately they are great ideas, but you guys haven't assessed the impacts of these propositions. And you can see which are going to be the impacts of people who are happy with these neighborhoods. It's one of the big impacts. I live in Garfield Street, and today I can only park in front of my house 20% of the time. 80% there's a car that is parked there. So there is an issue. Um, I don't know probably when people, I know that a few years ago it was, this is not something new, you guys have been talking to people. Probably at that time the area, that Colorado and Knight area was not part of the equation, so that has not been accounted. But definitely, you know, even increasing the, the permit for going higher rise in Colorado is going to impact again uh, Harrison, Jackson, Garfield. We are too close to Colorado River. So there are several things that all people that live in Harrison, Jackson, Garfield is going to be, is going to be you know, not happy at the end of the day with these reports. So it's something that you guys need to consider. I can't believe only 20% of the time I can get a spot in front of my house. Yes, and that is something we are considering. Uh, and there will be recommendations again about parking in the guide. Sure. Uh, hi, Mark Cavanaugh. I live on Monroe Street around 10th, and I've been here since the mid 90s. But um, I've been in Colorado my whole life, and this growth comes and goes in Colorado because that's the way Colorado is. And it isn't limited to, to the boundaries of Denver. So my question is, how is, the, and, and by the way, I believe in strong planning because that can actually prevent the bad zoning and the exceptional zoning and some of the bad things that happened in past years. So strong plans can be good plans. But if they're not coordinated with our fellow neighborhoods like Aurora, like Lakewood, like Wheat Ridge, like Arvada, because it's a regional thing, right? So I, from a Dr. Cog standpoint or whatever, how is this plugging in so that we're not taking the, the more than our regional share of the infill, if you will, and the growth. So that's the question. Yeah, so uh, this plan is really a subset of the citywide plans, uh, in Denver, uh, and in developing those plans, we work very closely with Dr. Cog on their regional projections, regional modeling, modeling on what the city's uh, growth would be. Uh, so the citywide plans look at the regional level uh, and how the city fits into the region, and then the, the neighborhood plans look at the city and how the the neighborhood fits into the city. So it's our mess. Timing wise, our projections came from Dr. Cobb. Right. That's where our growth projections came from. And are they, are other, our neighbors around Denver yeah. going through the same timing cycle as we are? So uh, we have recently instituted what we call the neighborhood planning initiative. The goal is to get these types of plans for the entire city over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, we just adopted the first one of them for the far northeast area up near the airport uh, earlier this year. Uh, we're working on the east and east central plans, as I mentioned right now. Once these wrap up, we'll start on the next three, uh, and we'll keep doing the entire city until we get them all covered. Uh, just Thank you. 
very low income. Each one of those thresholds is more expensive to build, right? Because you have to provide a bigger subsidy. So the idea with the incentive program is trying to maximize those benefits as much as we can while still remaining incentive for a developer to actually take advantage of it. So that will require a future study. But the question we're asking is, should we do that study? Should we embark down that project? That's what this plan would recommend or not recommend. That's the question we're asking. something we have struggled with in the past and we're always trying to do better. Uh, so we're, we're trying things to uh, make these plans equitable and fair and inclusive. Um, but it's, it's policies we're still involved. And also the community engagement aspect of that too. So you saw that when we were starting this process, everyone we were hearing from was kind of homogenous in one demographic group. So we put more resources and budget into reaching out to the groups that were missing and trying to get them involved in this process as well. Okay, because I don't really see a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Or people like children. Yeah. Um, for example. Yeah, and we have them like targeted outreach just for renters that are part of our whole collection of interest. That's great. Yes. Yeah, um, my name is Nora Kelly, and I live at Knife and Fillmore. Um, you know, I'm just curious if this kind of plan has ever been implemented in any other city. cities that are going through what Denver is going through with the rapid growth, uh, lack of affordable housing. Uh, if they you know, you know, so maybe to look at other cities that have implemented such a plan and found it either succeeded or this. Yes, uh, there are case studies that we've looked at, and they will be referenced in the plan. So when you look at the draft plan that comes out in October, uh, there will be references to um, where similar policies have been applied in other cities and how they've worked. So, yes, one more. Hi, my name's Gary. I'm at 12 in Madison. And uh, my question is about developers, uh, and in particular, um, what are the developers looking for? What are the things that they're coming to this um, platform and offering? And, and how can we better understand what their vision maybe are uh, in terms of what they want to invest so we can sort of have a better idea as homeowners and community members to uh, you know, have that same idea of what that vision might look like in their opinion uh, so we can respond, I guess, appropriately to what that vision might be. Yeah, uh, we've met with... Uh, Besides making money. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've met with developers, we've had uh, round tables um, and uh, working groups with developers. We have a couple of developers on our screen committee. Uh, so we do have that developer input in this planning process. Uh, and so, you know, the recommendations that you see, that, that you will see in the draft plan, are that balance between uh, the community and uh, the commercial property owners and the developers that have a stake in this in this area as well. Um, it's your, yeah, it's your, I mean, your, so your so point is... More is the, the people who want to develop these larger buildings, you know, the smaller ones, or are we talking about ones who want to you know, develop the one extra unit kind of thing? Right, so yeah, the developers we, that, that we've been talking to in our street are primarily commercial property owners and developers of mixed-use projects, not smaller scale, but we, we do okay, want to... Like what we're seeing on Colorado, for example. Yes, right. Right. So, you, I mean, you think you do your nail on it. I mean, developers are businesses for profit, so they're interested in making a profit. 
However, they do share, I think most of them share one value that neighbors share as well, it's predictability, right? They want to be able to make decisions in a predictable way. Neighborhoods want predictability about how their neighborhoods are changing. So I think a plan can help provide some of that guidance for, for everyone going forward. All right. Thank you guys yes. very much. Thank you everyone for coming out.